and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. This is our end of the session wrap-up, and today's guests are Molly Burke, Val Stewart, and Sarah Edwards, your representatives here in Brattleboro, and I'm Mike Merwicki from the Wyndham Five District of Putney, Westminster, and Dummerston. This was, uh, uh, I think, a landmark session in many ways. Uh, it was great to be in the legislature this year for a lot of reasons. Uh, we survived the legislature, we have survived the apocalypse and the rapture, and now here we are back home, and it's, it's great to be back home. So welcome for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here. The, uh, the session started in January with a lot of questions. Uh, the economy, the effects of the Great Recession were still hanging over us, and still are in some respects. Some of the questions were how would we work with the new governor? Uh, would we be able to to make some progress on health care? Would we be able to make some progress in telecom so we would lose our reputation as the can you hear me now state? And uh, with some other issues uh, very near and dear locally like energy and energy, uh, we had a lot of work before us. Um, Sarah, from your perspective, uh, how did it start? How did we answer those questions about working together in a tripartite fashion with all right, the parties right. there. And the independents. And the independents. Uh, well, um, I think that I, this is my ninth year. This was my ninth year, and next session be going into my tenth. And uh, this is the session that I felt was the most progress that we could have imagined making. And um, I really enjoyed the creativity that, that came out in addressing some of these big issues. We sort of had to just let go and really, really come together and tackle these big problems because they are huge problems. Many of them have been building up for years. So um, I, I found it a very refreshing, even in the midst of all the problems, just the spirit of how we worked together was wonderful. Um, there were a lot of bills introduced, as usual. We had 571 bills, so if people are wondering why their particular bill didn't get through. You really had to fight the crowd in this one or go with the flow one or the other to um, get some of the things that might have been very important for you through. Some of them rose to the top and most didn't. And that's the way the legislature is. So we did pass out, um, uh, the House passed out 50 of 460 bills and the Senate had 111 bills, and they passed out 25. Now, the, the, we're still waiting to hear all the results, because some bills, we're, we're not sure if they made it through or not, and will end up on the, the governor's desk. But we're getting close to knowing that. So. How, do you, how was it working with the new governor for you? Well, for the, with, that's partly what, I, what I was, my remarks were about, is uh, I feel like it was spectacular um, having Peter Shumlin as governor. He, I supported him from the very beginning, and I'm glad I did. And uh, he is somebody who, uh, with the big picture stuff, just knows what he's doing and knows how to, to create the structure and the flow uh, for us to get there. Health care um, and any number of other bills. I just think he's, uh, it, was, it was nice to see some things moving that really matter to Vermonters, including energy bills. So. Thank you. Val, what was your um, well, impression? Well, I uh, fully concur with Sarah with regard to Governor Shumlin. I think he did a stupendous job. Uh, I've always been a Peter Shumlin supporter because I think he's an incredible businessman, but he also has a very creative vision. And I knew if anybody could, um, you know, lead the way to universal health care, which is one of the primary reasons I wanted to run for the legislature, uh, that he would be able to bring that to fruition. So, um, and as a new legislator, I just thought it was a really incredibly in exciting time to be there. Uh, as I said, one of the reasons I really wanted to run was to pass H202, universal health care, which ensures that everyone has the human right, is guaranteed their human right to universal health care. So I thought that was really fabulous. Um, I thought the telecommunications bill was wonderful. And I think between universal health care 
and the telecommunications bill, we've made Vermont a more cost-effective and cyber-friendly place to do business, which is another key thing we all, I think, wanted to achieve, which was job creation. And I think we've paved the way for that. So I was really thrilled to be a part of the many achievements and um, the really fruitful session that we just had. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's yeah. great. I especially agree on telecommunications. What we found out this year is there's been a lot of money that was just sitting on the table no that question. we hadn't been using. And no what question. Governor Shumlin did was he's pulled together the people, he's put the plan, and, and I think we're actually going to see some action now. And the disappointing thing is that money had been sitting on the table, and we have to use it by 2014. Right. It's a use it or lose it. So, right. again, I think Peter's leadership has really stepped up and allowed us to, to join the rest of the world, hopefully, in, in what is no, essential to business education. No question. He's always had, you know, the vision and the tenacity and, you know, all capital letters, tenacity. That's Peter Shumlin. I mean, that's why he won a really tough race mm -hmm. for governor and that's why he um, was able to bring the telecommunications bill to bear. So it's just a really exciting time to be part of the legislature and I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be a Vermonter because I think Vermont is going to lead the way in particularly with regard to universal health care, which I think is, you know, we're the only developed country that doesn't have that. And yeah. that's, that's, really, that's really tragic for a lot of people. Now, this was your first year, freshman year. Yeah. When you were coming into this, did you have some ideas of what it would be like and how did that match up with the well, actual experience? For Mike Obohoski, I helped him with media relations way back when I first moved here. I moved here in 94 and 95, 96, that session I worked with. Um, he's more affectionately called Obi, and um, anyway, so I had a sense of what goes on, but only a sense. So um, I just, you know, I'm one of those people. I just, you know, jump in, eyes wide open, ears wide open, and um, you know, I think it's better not to have a lot of expectations. I was just excited about, you know, mm -hmm. working with all the great people and being in that fabulous building. And you know, I think Vermont is a really, truly special state, and I think we're able to do things that other states might not be able to do as easily and that's really exciting um, because we can, you know, the states frequently lead when it comes to uh, legislation. Uh, you know, the feds don't lead. Frequently yeah. they follow or, you know, put us in situations we don't want to be in and then we have to dig our way out. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to have you aboard this year. Thank you, Mike. And Molly Burke, welcome. And your Thank reflections you. on this session? Well, it was very exciting for me. This is my third year, and I'm on the Transportation Committee. And uh, what was really interesting is that we had the benefit of the stimulus money and transportation infrastructure for the past two years. So it was exciting to start the session and see that Vermont had made a little progress in terms of, of our ratings for, for bridges and for, for roads. Uh, and the other thing that was very exciting is with the Shumlin administration, the appointment of the Secretary of Transportation, the Deputy Secretary, uh, Brian Searles, the, de the, Treasure the Secretary of Transportation, had been Transportation Secretary before, very knowledgeable in transportation issues, had, had been head of Burlington Airport in the interim. Sue Minter, former legislator, and a professional planner as Deputy Secretary. So when they came in the first day to say, here are the priorities of the administration and of the Agency of Transportation, I felt like it was totally aligned with how I believe we need to think about our transportation system. We need to take care of our aging infrastructure, but we need to diversify. I mean, we, think, we talk about diversity in a lot of ways, diversifying agriculture, diversity of you know, cultures and all that. But to diversify our transportation system, meaning we need to pay attention to p making it possible for people to get around through public transit, through walking, through bicycling, and through rail. And those are exactly the priorities of the administration. And it was demonstrated in the budget, the budgets for, for those, um, those particular modes, those so-called alternative modes, I don't want to call them alternative modes, for multimodal transportation was up. So that was very, very exciting. And we, as a committee, uh, worked very, very well together. In a lot of ways, uh, it, it, transportation can become a little depoliticized, and that's really, really nice. So I, I really value the, um, the, the point of view of a lot of different people on our committee. And I think just saying a little thing about the committee process, because this is something I didn't really understand until I got to the legislature, was how much time is spent in committee. We're not just out there voting all the time on the floor. 
most of what we do happens in committee and and we go over things with such a fine tooth comb hearing from all stakeholders in a bill and the most sometimes you think do we really need to hear from another person on this issue and you do you really get such a, a well-rounded picture and and I it, it's really spilled over into other aspects of my life of just sort of trying to not to think about things in a really simplistic way and uh, it's it's been a very interesting journey for me and I and particularly this year it was pretty pretty special mm -hmm. can um, I just add to that Mike sure. I think uh, Molly touched on one thing that uh, was really uh, an improvement over previous years and that was the uh, appointments mm -hmm. Uh, that that Shumlin made, I think it, I think we were all very excited about the caliber of people who have been working on these issues in transportation, um, in health care. Uh, Doug Racine, he appointed so many excellent, excellent thinkers, um, and of course I'm thrilled about Liz Miller, who is the commissioner of the Department of Public Service, which, which deals with energy issues. But I wanted to give the governor credit for the team that he's assembled around him. And I think it's very important for how we're going to deal with things in the next session, which starts again in January. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And perhaps we could speak to that in each of our areas of, of jurisdiction. I know in Human Services, I sit on the House Human Services Committee, starting with Secretary Racine, mm -hmm. uh, we all felt that there wasn't anybody in the building who, who knows the, the landscape better than him. And then as you go down and look at the people that were pointed alongside that, uh, Human Services has a very wide uh, breadth of, of operations, from corrections to child care and lots right. in between. Um, for instance, uh, the, one of the biggest line items in that budget is the Department of Aging and Independent Living. And, and this addresses the concerns of our elder Vermonters and, and the the disabled, developmentally disabled. Um, the last administration had some good people working there, but the sense sometimes was they really didn't know the field they were in. And this year, uh, for instance, in the Department of Aging and Independent Living, the, the governor has brought in somebody who's a geriatric psychiatrist. Okay. So there's an example yeah. of somebody who's really at the top of their field, who knows what they're doing, and right on down the line. Our, our new Commissioner of Health is Dr. Harry Chen. He's an emergency room physician and a former legislator. Uh, so a as you go down the line, I think uh, we've all seen some, some really competent people who are, who are strong in their field and now bringing that expertise. And like you said, Liz Miller, and she's also heading up the VSNAP committee, right? And yes, she do is. Do you want to talk a little bit how that's changed? Well. Um, VSNAP, for those people watching who don't know what it stands for, it stands for the Vermont State Nuclear Advisory Panel. And um, it's, a, it's a, a body of people who uh, have, it's in, it's, it, it's in statute that we need to meet. And we had some problems in the past with meeting, that the meetings weren't called, and it was certainly uh, a time when we needed to be having this discussion. So with her tenure, her brief tenure so far, we've already met twice. Mm -hmm. And we all know that the issues keep, are, keep getting increasingly complex. Um, so she's done a terrific job on that. She's also, you know, her department is um, uh, responsible for telecom and how we roll that out. Mm -hmm. And the, the point is to have that rolled out by 2013 and to also make sure you examine all the issues that arise on the way there because we think it should be a straight path, but there's so many complexities. The other thing that, that the department is going to be addressing, of course, is the upcoming smart grid. And that is a very complex issue. The idea of smart grid itself is a complex system. And there will be a lot of social issues that come along with um, unrolling that. And that is also uh, uh, planned to be completed by 2013. And uh, uh, Senator Sanders has done a terrific job in spurring this and uh, creating the partnership between Sandia National Labs, which is located in New Mexico, and UVM. So they have a, a, um, a very bright partnership that will be looking at all of the issues, some social policy issues, some technology issues um, that, that, you know, that will help make this happen. So hopefully we can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, another thing that 
has been of interest in Brattleboro, and I think that she has helped move along in Montpelier, is a district heating system yep. uh, or, or co-generating system. Yep. Um, any sense of whether that can trickle down to Brattleboro and help move that project that's been languishing uh, for Well, um, years? certainly the uh, foundation has been uh, provided, um, and the legislature actually at the very last minute uh, did provide some incentives for biomass. I'm just, those are now trickling out to me now. Um, I'm supposed to be meeting with someone today about that, but um, I have to do a little more research on what actually happened. Yeah. You know how it is at the end. When you get to a committee of conference, right. new things can come into the picture that, that you might not have known about from the other body. And that was how sometimes politics plays out at the right. end between the House and Senate. Because right. I believe your bill originally had that in. No, we didn't and, discuss and didn't, the incentives. Okay. Um, but, but the, the district Senate heating had. system. In, in well, that. in particular, it would be some uh, programmatic um, offerings that yeah. would help that, not specifically yeah. about BTU. Yeah. But uh, we'll see how we can draw out from those new provisions. Mm -hmm. Lots going to happen in October when we get the final report from the biomass working group. Yeah. So you never know. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. You, know, you were on the education committee, Val. Yeah. And this is certainly, um, it was a different tenor. In, in the last eight years, yeah. we didn't talk that much about education. Uh, a lot yeah. of the, the Fire and Light was about education funding, and I think education itself tended to get pushed aside. And, and that changed this year. I think we started to look more at quality and content. Yeah, and I think we passed some really wonderful bills that um, really addressed both quality and content. Um, on Well, let's see. Quality, well, one of the bills uh, that we passed, S-53, removes the caps on pre-K children who may be enrolled and funded in pre-K education programs through public schools. And that is really important, Mike, because I'm sure as you're well aware, being in the human services area, um, children who are not kindergarten ready, and particularly those who come from underprivileged or poor poverty-stricken homes, um, basically start kindergarten not ready frequently and that inhibits their learning and in most of the developed world pre-k is a very important part of the educational system so this is a local decision the local school districts can make that decision with regard to whether or not they want to help fund pre-k but the long and the short of it is uh, there's a very good reason most of the developed world has pre-k and it's because children come to school ready to learn and prepared to learn and therefore hopefully by the end of third grade they can indeed read and as I'm sure you're well aware children who cannot read by the end of third grade frequently end up they build prisons <laughs> based on that factoid so uh, that's just a real travesty um, and this will be of particular help as I said to impoverished children um, the other thing we did which is really really important is we passed a bill which provides for mentoring, uh, basically mandates mentoring of not only principals, um, but technical center directors who are new to the job. So for the first two years, a principal or a technical center director will be mentored by someone who has been a principal or a technical school director. And that old saying, which applies in business, also applies in other organizations like schools, which is it's lonely at the top. Mm -hmm. and as all of us as parents know, having walked into our children's elementary schools, principals do a lot. They uh, deal with the staff, they deal uh, with uh, you know, children, they deal with parents, they wear a lot of hats in one 24-hour day, uh, you know, frequently attend meetings at night. So uh, this mentoring program will really help them um, be better at the job and um, ensure greater longevity in the jobs, which basically, Schools with stable principals do better, and interestingly enough, also uh, poor children who go to those schools do far better if there's a steady home-like environment where they feel nurtured and taken care of. So that was another really cool thing we did. And then, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, um, we did a cyber bullying piece. We added that to uh, the harassment, which mm -hmm. basically expands the nexus of 
um, the school's purview in terms of if a child is cyber bullied outside of school, the administration can still basically uh, take measures to punish might not be the best word, but at least ensure that it doesn't impede another child or student's access to their education. So that was pretty cool and we did a, um, we also did a uh, concussions bill, which mm -hmm. having had real jock kids who played soccer and that sort of thing, and it just basically mandates that um, a licensed health care provider, in, um, if a kid's taken out of a game, a licensed health care provider has to check and make sure that that kid is indeed ready to go back in the game, and um, that's that's a really sure. big thing too. So those are four of the, you know, things from one end of the spectrum to the other we did to ensure child safety, cyberbullying, and uh, the concussion spill, and then um, quality of education starting early with the pre-K and um, good principals, you know, equaling good schools. So we supported that. So, yeah, it was really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. And like Molly was saying, the committee process is amazing. You really see an issue from every angle. You consider every angle. You listen to endless testimony, and uh, then all of a sudden, you know, you feel like you really have a hold on what is the best thing to do. So. And we haven't had anybody on education out of our county delegation mm -hmm. for a while, oh, so yeah. it's, it's, it's been good to have a representative because it's certainly an issue that's yeah. near and dear to many of us. And here. if I could just say one last thing, we heard a lot of testimony. We have so many colleges, and you know, we heard a lot of talk of Vermont being able to become the education state. I mean, we really need to promote that as a state. This is something we have, you know. So, um, and with Governor Shumlin, as um, he has such a strong proclivity to supporting education. So um, I really think we can become the education state, really promote our wonderful, wonderful higher institutions of learning from UVM to Castleton State and that sort of thing. And that can also, you know, bring income, much needed income into the state from elsewhere, which is yeah. a great thing. So yeah. thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, Molly, you had a busy year in transportation too, and I think one of the things that I hear as much from any uh, on any one particular bill in, in this regard is about the Complete Streets Bill. Yes, a bill near and dear to my heart. I was the lead sponsor, and uh, it that bill actually is so interesting. It it sometimes there are things in the air, and then all of a sudden they're everywhere. And I think the the Complete Streets Bill, which was the bill number was H198, was really about accommodating. Um, and considering the needs of all users of the transportation system. It was a bill that was pushed by AARP because we have an aging population in this country, particularly in the state. How are people going to get around? Um, but it was also supported by um, environmental groups. Vermont Natural Resource Council supported it because they are promoting smart growth. If you have sort of uh, more, you want to have more density, you want to have better sort of walking, bicycling, public transit in those population densities. Uh, there are so it touched on so many issues, and so many people wanted to come into this committee and testify. And we had the commissioner of health because we have a huge obesity problem in the state and in the country. And if you do not have an infrastructure that allows somebody, maybe says, you know, I'd go out and walk, but it's just not safe. So it's really about providing an infrastructure. We had the head of the Department of um, Public Health, or the head, sorry, not department, the head of pu the Vermont Public Health Association. We had the Attorney General, who's on an, an obesity um, initiative. And along with, you know, as I said, environmental groups, and it really touched on so many issues. And, uh, you know, particularly, I think, the issue of we have been an auto-centric culture. And everything has sort of, you know, well, we don't, have, we don't have money for that, or, well, we can do the sidewalks when we have a little bit of extra money or whatever. And we need to really think comprehensively, and particularly because we are, have a society based on single occupancy vehicle, and we have a huge problem with carbon emissions. And I believe, I, I was just at UVM, my niece graduated from UVM this weekend, the governor spoke there, and spoke very eloquently as he does, and he's really taken leadership, I think, on the whole issue of, of how we need to cut our emissions and how we are actually seeing the effects of this, the flooding in Lake Champlain, severe storms, tornadoes, um, the, this rain in May. I mean, I, I really believe that we are in a different kind of climate right now, and we need to really take note of that. So, so many different ways that this bill touches touches on that. 
I came last night, uh, the town plan, the transportation section of the town plan was being discussed, and actually Complete Streets principles are enshrined in our town plan. That's what I mean about it being everywhere. And then I was listening to NPR this morning, and the, they were talking about it as wanting to be a national policy as part of the new federal uh, transportation reauthorization bill. So it's sort of been very exciting to be on that wave mm -hmm. and, and, and had a wonderful, lot of wonderful partners to work with, particularly AARP. They were just great and had their resources to really move this along. So, uh, so that made it a really fun session for me, you know, in addition to all the other advantages of working with a wonderful Wyndham County delegation and uh, working with great people uh, in the agencies and in the legislature. How will people notice the effect of the complete streets bill in well, their everyday lives? Well, that's a really lives. good question. <laughs> Um, first of all, the bill, in order to pass and in order to pass muster with all the different parties, the, it, the bill is not a mandate. And uh, so, in other words, it, it, it basically says that in any new construction project, the uh, state or municipality needs to consider, and that word consider was very carefully considered, not accommodate, but consider the needs of all potential users. So, and if not, there are three outs, you know, that it, it's beyond the scope of the project, it's prohibited by law, it's on an interstate, or it's the cost is way out of proportion to the need. So there are three ways, but that will be documented so that somebody could click on a project, a new project, say, you know, we're gonna have a new paving project here, and, and there's gonna be, um, they're gonna be developing some kind of a checkbox that says you know whether they consider this or not and why or why not. So there is accountability, but it's it's really I don't think you're going to. Somebody emailed me and said, "Oh, can we can can complete streets now do this bike path?" And it's really there's no funding there. It's really about comprehensive planning and thinking. So you might start to notice it in new projects, or you will start to notice it in new projects. But to me, the most important part is it represents a change of culture in the way we think about this. So that's the victory, I think. Mm. Really. Well, thank you for your work on that. I know this yeah. is something that you've been, you and a lot of other people have Me been working on for a people. while. Me and a lot of other people, yes, a lot of other people. And uh, once again, here's something that's coming to fruition under Governor mm -hmm. Shumlin. Um, I'd like to give a little bit of a perspective on human services. Um, I sit on the House Human Services Committee and uh, when the governor put out his initial budget, it was probably the, the area because it's the largest piece of the state budget that, uh, so there was a lot of scrutiny. There were a lot of, a lot of controversy around some of the proposals the governor put forward. And um, I think that was the source of a lot of conflict. Um, we got a lot done, we worked together well, but there, you know, what we want to share, there was a great deal of conflict between the administration and the legislature, especially around the budget. Uh, talking about revenues, talking about proposed cuts, and uh, one of the things I think we all appreciated, though, is working with this administration was was really different than that. We felt like all of our negotiations were um, uh, straightforward in a way that hadn't happened before. Starting with the budget, we got a whole budget to work with earlier than we'd ever done before, and it was one of the reasons we got out earlier. Um, they had done their homework, they had presented to us in, in a way that we could get working on it right away. It, for probably the first month of the session, House Human Services Committee looked and considered carefully a lot of the budget cuts that were proposed. And, and we didn't agree with a lot of them, and we let the governor know, we let the House Appropriations Committee know. And in the end, the Appropriations Committee did a lot of work to support our suggestions not to go with the level of cuts that was proposed. And, and as we're moving ahead, the economy is moving a little better. We have more revenues, so we're, we're actually able to, to lessen the, the impact to where, um, because corrections is a part of human services, that was the area where the biggest cuts actually came. Um, there were some cuts that came in other areas, which, which are unfortunate, but the reality is the numbers have to add up. and. Uh, we're still trying to look at how we can continue to, to protect the most vulnerable Vermonters uh, and be responsible uh, to the budget. So that's, as we move ahead, I think that's going to continue to be the, the challenge. 
in, in, in many areas, though, I think we, we did really well. Child care uh, assistance, once again, uh, was not cut. Uh, last year it wasn't cut either. Two years ago we actually increased the amount in the bad budget year. So the, the governor has uh, followed through on his commitment to that, and we're especially concerned about how we take care of the elderly and the disabled, too, and in those areas we were able to, to mitigate and lessen any proposed cuts. Uh, so by the time we got done, I think most agencies were expecting a 5% cut. and In some areas it wasn't even that, it was maybe 2%. Which, given the economy, and when we look at the other states around us where there's just chaos and there's been some awfully uh, difficult cuts to these kinds of services, um, I think we're doing pretty well in Vermont. Uh, two of the things that came out of House Human Services Committee, I feel, are, are really forward-thinking bills. One was looking at our elders and, and trying to increase um, adult protective services. We have a... a uh, an effective system of trying to protect our children from abuse and neglect. And it's, it's a system that's undergoing changes, but we're, we're continuing to look at that because we know we can do better, and we have to for our children. Uh, likewise, as our adult population grows, uh, we're feeling like there's an inadequate system for protecting our elders who are in the care of others, people who uh, might even be living at home, and that's one of the things that we, we um, looked at was um, people who are neglecting themselves, how do we look at that? As, and right alongside people who are living under the care of others in nursing homes and smaller, smaller centers, there needs to be a better way of making sure those Vermonters are taken care of and getting the care they want. So that was one of the bills we put forward. And the other bill we spent a lot of time was, was is around palliative care. This is an issue as, as all of us age, uh, we would all do well to start looking at. And, the, and just the, the, the issue of palliative care raises the question for many people, what is palliative care? And, and um, in the treatment of, of chronic disease, in the treatment of, of uh, what, what can be a, a fatal disease, um, there's a, a different sense of how, how we want to look at uh, treatment plans. And what we want to do is look at making people comfortable. Uh, treating the whole person and the whole family. And as a part of that, we look at various modalities of care, uh, pain management in a way that this is a new specialty that uh, a lot of physicians who uh, are not recent graduates of medical school just didn't get this. So what we're trying to do is raise the profile for the general public, as well as raising the profile for the, the, the medical profession. Another area where we uh, are trying to generate more discussion around for individuals and their families is around advanced directives and utilizing our online directory. Uh, advanced directives are the plan we put in place, a personal plan, for how we would like to move towards the end of life. Um, what kind of care do we want? What kind of care do we not want? I think it's important for us to talk about these things before we get in a, dis in a situation where um, decisions have to be made at, in, in the moment. And for all of us, for our families, those of us who are taking care of elders, friends, spouses, even children in these situations, it behooves us, I believe, to have those discussions now. And in terms of an advanced directive, um, it's a good thing to have, but if you don't have it online, basically you have to keep it in your pocket at all times so people know what what to do in case something happens. With the, with the online directory, any place, uh, any doctor's office, any hospital, medical provider, they can access that uh, should the need arise. So uh, the way to access that, there's a few, few ways to access information about that. The, the State Department of Health's website has information about that. The Vermont Ethics Network has been a, a real key partner in this. And, and then my own website, Wyndham5, and that's the number 5.net, uh, I've got links to this too. Um, and as we move ahead, you know, this is something I think we're, we're, all, we're all heading in that direction, whether we like it or not, and it's something we can, we can do to, to make things better for ourselves. I, I would like to comment on that. I think that it's really important for people to have choices, yeah. especially at, with end-of-life choices yeah. and, and how you want to be treated. And we actually have a really great organization in Brattleboro 
that serves Wyndham County exactly. in the Brattleboro Area Hospice. Yeah. And um, uh, people shouldn't underestimate the, um, the work that they do here exactly. in the county. And um, you can also find information from, yeah. from that organization to help you if you're struggling with making these decisions. It's a good point. They're not just <coughs> the people to call when you have a loved one who who's, uh, has a diagnosis of six months. Right. Or, uh, right. There are lots of reasons that, to get involved right. with, with that organization. They have classes. Yep. Uh, they have a, uh, people who are out there who mm -hmm. can advise you. And, and I, it's a great point to make. We're, yeah. We have one of, the, one of the better hospices in the area. I think we do. In, in the state. Yeah. And I, I think it's a, it's a great it's organization It's well managed to and yeah. uh, it can help you get well informed. Yeah. So, Looking Plug ahead, ahead. Uh, before we close, uh, we're, before you know it, we're going to be heading to Montpelier again. Mm -hmm. Although. Hopefully summer will be here soon and we can enjoy that, but um, what are your hopes for the next session? Well, uh, one of the things that's going to be coming our way and that we're going to have to discuss as a state is the uh, smart grid. And I know that there are a lot of concerns. A lot of people are completely excited about this number of reasons. It's really going to help us accommodate our policy of moving forward with renewables. And as you know, renewables have an intermittent, in general, the wind when it's blowing, the sun when it's shining. And the issue around that, of course, is that we don't have enough, we don't have the technology for storage right now. We will, but it's not here right now. And Smart Grid, on the very, very positive side, is going to help us get there because if you have Smart Grid, where before you might have two places of data collection, in order to manage all the different interactions going on with, through the transmission. With Smart Grid, you're going to have, be able to have 30 data inputs in a second, which is what we need to have to manage all the different inputs for the system. I know that sounds a little wonky, and it is, but uh, it, is, it is something we're going to be learning a lot about. Um, there are some concerns that people have that we'll be addressing as Val and Molly talked about the committee process. We will be taking lots and lots of testimony around this issue, including some uh, people who have health concerns uh, about the fact that it's a radio frequency. And the other is privacy issues, which, as we know, um, is going to be a big problem uh, for people who like to go in and play around and do hacking or for marketers, even though your personal identification won't be identified, they're going to take the data of usage, which is to serve one purpose, but can also be used the, for the purpose of marketing. So if you're able to look at the data, even in the aggregate, you're going to be able to figure out, well, these patterns here are presenting you know, this type of use, and maybe it's the appliances, so I can do marketing to that neighborhood or that group of people around appliances, which on the one hand is good because we are trying to reduce our energy consumption and to manage our ener energy consumption better, but do you really want somebody being able to target you in their market? I mean, they do it already. It's very hard to stop that, but it's just, it's just another issue of the, you know, the technology interaction with us as a society and as a culture. But um, it does have enormous benefits. It's going to, it, it will be able to help us manage our enormous consumption, which grows even with efficiency. Imagine if we didn't have our efficiency utility, yeah. efficiency Vermont. Um, and one of the proudest moments that um, at, I went to a two-day conference on this was the fact that, um, first of all, our senator, Bernie Sanders, is the one who initiated this conversation. And number two, Sandia, there were other people wanting to have this for their state, but we got it. Because um, a couple of things. Number one, we have 20 utilities. Most states have two or three. And uh, part of this, I believe, is due to the fact that we did not deregulate where the big, big companies could come in and buy up all the small companies. We still have 20 utilities, plus our transmission utility. Um, and what they noticed about us was the skill with which Vermonters can work together toward a common goal. And so this meant that they would, their time investment and 
whatever funding investment, we got $69 million from the federal government, which has been matched by the utilities. Meant that they want to work with people who have a likelihood of succeeding and don't waste a lot of time bickering and figuring out who's going to outcompete whom. It's just not in our cards to behave that way when we want to get together with a common goal. So um, even with the issues, there are a lot of advantages and there may be, and, and the one thing too is we don't want to raise people's expectations. Like this isn't going to make your bill go down to, you know, $2 a month. There, there, there's some ways it can help. Mostly it's helping getting us into the future if we begin to have a, a fleet of electric cars, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's going to have a particular way it, ha it handled on the grid. And you need to have a complex system, again, that can help manage that. But um, Liz Miller, who is the commissioner, um, has said that there will be people who do not want to become involved in this and one of the things that they're going to be proposing is an opt-out provision. You're either in unless you opt out. And we'll have to see how all this plays out. But it's going to play out quickly, so I would encourage people to pay attention mm -hmm. to it because we have to use this money by 2013, yeah. same as with telecom. So don't think you're going to have that much time to not get yourselves involved with this if you have objections. Sure. Find out, get answers to your objections. Um, 2012 is a big date for Entergy, yes, too. It is. And there continues to be what I consider misinformation put out there that if we don't relicense Vermont Yankee, Vermont's not going to have power and the cost is going to go through the roof. Well, what, what's the facts? On please that? remember, number one, that we aren't in charge of relicensing. Uh, they've already uh, gotten their license to go forward. The state is involved in operation. That's where we have some say. And I think it's important for people to mm -hmm. remember that. And legislators. And legislators as well. We are... Because we've, we've gotten sued. <coughs> we've all, every Vermonter yeah. has gotten sued, so you should know that out there. Uh, the other thing is, too, is one way to look at it is that your, your 16-year-old child can go get their license. It's perfectly legal for them to do that. But who's the one in charge of saying whether they can drive that car, yeah. whether they can operate that vehicle? And that's us. And that's what's being challenged in the yeah. courts, yeah. and also uh, what rights we do have. Sure. And um, so, so, do we have enough energy? We absolutely do. Yes, and uh, uh, it's it's in unrealistic to think that you know immediately we're going to go to all of our renewables. We're still in the development pay phase, and I think that for three to five years we're going to have to be working really fast and really hard to make sure. But it's, it's the obligation by law for us to have power. Sure. Utilities, they're businesses. Sure. They are going to have Plan B. They do have Plan B. In fact, the Vermont Energy Cooperative um, just turned down an offer from Entergy. I mean, they have not made themselves very attractive. And again, you know, Mike, when you and I talk, we always say that this is not about the people who work and run that plant it goes uh, up to management and also the company ownership. Yeah. Uh, so we always want to talk about that, that uh, they've done a terrific job. Sure. And we get our power from the New England grid. We get it from the grid. So there's plenty of electricity there. Right, unless you begin your own net metering project, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're getting it from the grid. Yeah. So, um, and even then they have to make sure you've got yeah. power even if you're just net metered, unless you're completely off and not connected at all to the grid. And if you're not connected to the grid, then you can't net meter because yeah. you're not putting anything back into the system. Well, I just mentioned so. it because it seems like uh, Entergy is spending a lot of money. Oh, they know how to spend money to, to tell on people the wrong things. There's not, there's not going to be enough electricity. <laughs> right. It's just not true. And I, I really want the, the listeners today and the viewers today to understand that you, your lights will not go off. You will be able to run your air conditioning as little as possible, of course. <laughs> uh, that's in terms of conservation of energy. Yeah. But you, n nothing is going to change. It doesn't go, it doesn't change when we have the outages for refueling. Yeah. I, I haven't yeah. noticed the lights going out. No. So. And one of the things, again, with Smart Grid, in terms of this, it's going to make our system more reliable. Yeah. And um, with energy gone, we're going to have the same standards of reliability because they're codified in law. Yeah. 
they have to have these standards yeah. of reliability. Yeah. So I hope that answers some of your question, but people sure. should really be able to calm down about this. Yeah. The, there, was, there was no contract, so how do we know what the price would be? Right. The contract is over 2012. There has been no new contract negotiated. Entergy really did not make a bona fide offer yeah. that was meaningful to the utilities or to the people of Vermont. Yeah. So we just need to move on yeah. and get on with our new picture. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. So, Val, what are you looking forward to in the next session? Uh, well, I'm really looking forward to, as I mentioned earlier, uh, lifting the pre-K caps was, you know, I think a really wonderful achievement in terms of strengthening access um, uh, for early education, preschool education, so that kids arrive kindergarten ready. On the other end of the spectrum, um, I think what we really want to do as a state is strengthen access to higher education. Yes. And I mean, it just yeah. makes so much sense. And one of the ways we can do that, and we did do that, is through S100, which was a miscellaneous um, tax um, bill education bill rather that had everything in there but the kitchen sink and one of the things that it did do is strengthen the continuum between uh, basically uh, you know high school and college and high school kids na can take um, basically courses in high school that then apply toward college they get college credit for and the long and the short of it is that number one saves money because uh, you know they it's just it saves money, and the other thing it does is it um, tends to heighten the likelihood, particularly in families where young people are going, they're the first kids in their family to attend college. It enhances the likelihood that that kind of kid will take a course that will set his or her imagination on fire, and then they will go on to college. Um, so that's really exciting, and um, I think the other thing we're really going to continue to do is uh, make sure that we heard a lot of testimony. You know, education, particularly higher education, is not a one-size-fits-all kind of scenario, and the long and the short of it is some kids might be better suited to go to a technical center, get a vocational trade, and off they go to become an electrician and make a very wonderful living, but, you know, they don't need to do the whole four-year college deal. So. Um, I, we're going to continue to work on ways of trying to figure out how we can funnel kids into the thing that's right for them, how we can get them engaged in the thought, this is really important, of being the kind of person that will go to college. We heard testimony. That starts in grade school. Mm -hmm. In grade school, kids start to think, I can go to college or not, I will go to college or not. Families start having that conversation. Some of these kids, by the time they enter high school, I mean, they're not going to college. They're not even thinking about it. It's not even in their mindset. So um, we have to do something as a culture to change that because, um, you know, we need to give everyone the education and skills they need to do something that they find rewarding. You know, they don't have to be a doctor or a lawyer. They might want to be a craftsperson or, you know, a mechanic. But um, everybody, all vocations should be respected and um, that sort of thing. So we're going to work on, continue to work on strengthening not only the dual enrollment piece, but also the, um, you know, mitigating the kind of one size fits all approach and starting to really figure out how to get the message out way earlier in life. And we're talking in um, grade school that you too, even if you come from a family where no one has attended college, you can go to college. So. That's, I think, the most exciting thing. Education is about the future, and um, I think Vermont has a really bright future in that arena. Okay, thank you, Val. Yeah, thank you very much. Molly, your um, thoughts for One that? of the things I'm looking forward to is um, working a little bit more in public transit. I was just appointed to the Public Transit Advisory Council for the state, and sort of looking at the whole transit system. We have a very good uh, regional public transit system. We have to do some things with our long distance carrier. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say is that um, the just the connection between what we do in Montpelier and ordinary people's lives. And that to me is one of the really neat things is you get a call from a constituent and it's not necessarily about the legislation you're passing, but sometimes it's about the access that we can help somebody to solve their own problem by putting them in touch with the right people. And so I'm hoping that people who are listening will will call us and we may be able to direct them in the in a way that, that might help them with their particular problem. Yeah. So not that we can solve every problem, but we can possibly help. 
So I just wanted to bring that in. Well, thank you, Molly. Thank you, everybody. I think as we look ahead to next year, we're certainly going to be continuing to look at the economy. Uh, the next steps in health care, because this is just the beginning of, of what we're doing in health care. And uh, what we want to make sure people know is we're here to represent you. We want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And you're the ones who, who make our jobs possible. And uh, representative democracy is, is alive and well in Vermont because you have a citizen legislature. And we want to stay connected with you. Uh, they're going to be showing our contact information, uh, I, I believe, as, as we finish the show, so I appreciate that uh, BCTV has continued to make this uh, possible and, and, and make the state, uh, your state legislators more accessible to you. I think so we're all fans of yeah. BCTV, you bet. and I, I want to make sure that we can keep that going into the future. Yeah, you bet. I, I really appreciate the work they've done. It's not that far away, but for some people it's a huge distance, and what BCTV does is help bridge that distance between Montpelier in, in here in Brattleboro in Wyndham County. So thanks to you for checking in with us and, and thanks to our legislators here in Brattleboro and look forward to a, a, a nice refreshing summer and getting back to it in January. And thanks to you for watching. Thanks for Mike for hosting. Thank you Mike. Okay. Thank you very much Mike. Bye bye for now. <laughs>